Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Charlton. I'm from Skills Education. Thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first visit, welcome. If you've been on a skills education session before, thank you and welcome back. Today, we have Deb Carr with us to talk about her research into RPL and how RTOs can make assessment-only pathways a more efficient and effective option for their operations. So very pleased that Deb is here on Skills Education, which is the network supporting presenters who support vet practitioners. Now, whilst everyone's getting settled, I'll run through some quick housekeeping. If you were in the waiting room, you probably saw some of these slides. So I'll just got a, an abridged version that I'll share with you. If you've missed the information, the cliff notes on how to use the system that we're operating on today. We're going to be using the chat window and I can see there's uh, a few people already in there saying hello and uh, good morning. So welcome. Um, there is already a question in the chat, so we're really encouraging people to uh, respond and participate in the session by using the chat. If there's something specific that you want Deb to address, next to the chat tab, we have Q&A at the top. So just pop your questions into the Q&A. We'll make sure that we can address those at the end of Deb's presentation today. Moving across the top, we've also got some polls active, and I know that there's one there specifically for today's session and RPL. Handouts are also available. So if you go across to the handouts, you'll be able to download them immediately and get the, the background on the co-presenters that Deb has invited along for today's session. Now, I will let you know that today's session is being recorded. So once the live event is finished, usually within about 24 hours, you'll get a system generated notification that you can then uh, view the recording. Now, this is available to everyone who has registered and paid for the event. You just need to head over to the VEDA portal, log in through there, and you'll be able to see the replay. After the session, you'll also get an email from the VEDA portal inviting you to provide feedback. Now, today's session is eligible for a PD record, and to have that record issued to you, you need to respond to that email asking for feedback. You can submit um, a blank form. It is totally anonymous, but we definitely know that all of the skills education presenters value the input and feedback that you have. Now, uh, on that, we would like to offer a big thank you to VETA. They are supporting us in all of the sessions by providing the technology behind the system. And that symbiotic relationship really helps us because we don't have to reinvent an existing wheel. Now, that's the admin out of the way. Over to what we're here for now. As I said, Deb Carr is our special guest for today, and she's going to be kicking off her 10 session series on 10 tips to doing RPL better. Now, this first session is going to look at the implications of this often heard phrase, it's just easier to do the course. We'll also nut out how to um, how competent and experienced staff who are solely dedicated to RPL can actually be a good business decision for RTOs. To give you a little bit of background info on Deb, she's a perpetual enthusiast for lifelong learning programs, and she's recently completed a Master of Education for Global Learning, where her thesis was on the RPL candidate, the neglected stakeholder. So given that RPL is a mandatory requirement for all RTOs, Deb's session really promises to provide insight into ways that this could be done differently and or in better ways. And we're so lucky to have Deb here today to share some of that expertise. So I'm going to say welcome to Deb and hand over. And I have seen that there are a few people uh, in the chat asking about sound issues. Um, just make sure that you've got your uh, volume up. I'm going to respond to those just now. Won't be a moment and handing over to Deb. Welcome, Deb. Thanks, Michelle. Lovely to have everybody here today. G'day. Um, these sessions are for training managers and RPL practitioners that seek to do RPL better. Skills development policymakers would also benefit. Today, I will uh, quickly share my research methodologies, very high level share overall findings, 
pre-recorded and then we'll go on to listen to pre-recorded interviews of our guests Wendy Cato and Nicole Barrett. They will both share good practice around allocating um, staff solely dedicated to RPL. Wendy and Nicole, welcome, are in our audience and we'll welcome questions later on. Um, a note for our international audience, context is the Australian VET system. Um, RPL assesses informal learning as per defined in our AQF. As Michelle said, I've conducted this research as part of a Masters of Education at CDU, which actually included an international study tour. My current day job is with VetAssess, where I'm privileged to help other countries implement and improve their RPL frameworks. My research revealed many problems associated with the implementation of RPL. No surprises there. As I continue to research, listen and practice, potential solutions are evolving. This 10 part series de delivers 10 possible solutions to doing RPL better. I make no claim of these being the only solutions, but I think they go a long way towards doing RPL better because they speak directly to candidate experience. We do have systemic problems with RPL in Australia. These sessions recognise RPL is not done well, but can be done better within the system that we do have. Australia's national competency-based RPL framework is envied by many, many countries. The changing nature of work, globalisation, ageing demographics and the rapid pace of technological advancements drive their national imperative for RPL. COVID-19 has placed even more imperative on RPL. Efficient use of skills directly impacts our economy and social fabric now more than ever. So this webinar is to inform your decisions about RPL with evidence and case studies of good practice. This is not a platform to check compliance or technical issues. We encourage you to share contact details in the pursuit of good RPL practice. Use this webinar as a lens to make good decisions for your organisation about RPL. This lens helps you maintain the human as central to your RPL decisions. There's a bit of context. So my study consisted of two stages. The first stage, um, I interviewed assessors to gauge what kind of problems were out there. Um, assessors had extensive experience in RPL, collectively over 5,000 RPL assessments across all AQF levels and all institution types and many training packages. I asked assessors from their experience, what difficulties do candidates experience? I then worked with 11 candidates across five months who were applying for RPL in the TAE package as it happens. They were from varied backgrounds, including organisation, learning and development professionals. For this study, difficulties are defined as um, things that make RPL hard to accomplish, deal with, or understand. Not necessarily insurmountable and doesn't necessarily cause candidates to quit RPL. I presented my research at the NCVR No Frills Conference last year. It was well received. Um, subsequent to that, I was asked to, as a project advisor um, of a Commonwealth commissioned investigation into RPL uptake. So it appears we're starting to get some Commonwealth interest which is great. So I analysed 387 expressions of difficulties into 13 different topics. I then multiplied the frequency of expression by the number of candidates that mentioned the problem. This gave me an indication of breadth as well as depth of the problem. I titled that impact of difficulty score, as you see here. These webinars present solutions, possible solutions, that speak to these problems. I fur further analysed um, the topics into themes. Each theme is represented by the letter at the end of the um, topic on this graph. The themes were mindset, mental attitude making RPL hard to accomplish, deal with or understand. 
documentary evidence. Now, this isn't this difficulty is not actually about understanding evidence or what is needed. These difficulties arise when candidates have actually worked out what evidence is needed, what evidence is. They just have difficulty in getting their hands on it and providing it. Employer dynamics. These are difficulties caused by the employer that make it difficult to access evidence. Time, being time poor, particularly for periods that allow for focus. Candidates said 20 minutes here and there didn't work for them. They really needed two hours at a time to concentrate on their submission. So here's a visual representation of um, Here's a visual representation of the distribution of the problems in the themes. Remembering that these were TAE students and I followed their journey over five months. Mainly around mindset. So these, um, this was the result of the um, stage one conversations with the assessors. Um, remarkably similar. When comparing both those um, analytics, five things became really evident to me. Mm. Mindset is a difficulty no matter the candidate. The main difference between non-TAE candidates and TAE candidates is understanding RPL, which is a no-brainer. Employer dynamics, this represents a significant difficulty. This has not been previously identified in research. Assessors, number three, assessors do correctly identify difficulties that candidates experience. However, they feel disempowered to make any difference for them. They know what they have to do. They feel they don't have the agency to help. Number five, the need for this research. In exploring candidates' voice is needed. For example, assessors correctly um, relayed that students have difficulty with mapping and they're not in the habit of thinking about evidence or in fact, sometimes skills. Um, however, some candidates say, we do get mapping, we do get evidence, and we understand RPL. That's not the problem. It's literally getting the evidence that is the problem. So there is a need to research candidates' voice. So these are the problems that we're going to focus on today. These problems transpire as significant barriers for RPL being done well. Many assessors feel they are not professional at RPL. Many complain their workloads don't allow them to conduct it in a way that they know that they should and need to. And many assessors are just not invested in RPL. Many candidates complain assessors never get back to them. They just want someone to talk to. They feel isolated and they want flexible structure. Flexibility for different assessment methods, structures, they need deadlines. It's very easy to procrastinate on RPL. So let's investigate a little bit about these problems before we hear a couple of real life scenarios with um, Nicole and Wendy. So candidates do have an expectation that RPL is a supported activity from start to finish. They say things like, well, they did say, I'm not getting the responses I need. Meetings are changed. Other things come and I think it's easy for RPL candidates to get pushed back. I'm working on my own. I don't have classmates like other students. So it does feel to me the RPL process is secondary for the RTO. I guess the other delivery gets priority because it's far more structured. Candidates identified innate differences between mainstream students and RPL candidates. Assessment only students seem to be left um, to their own means. Many say they need timely feedback. I just want someone to chat to, this is my situation. 
a little while ago I submitted it, but I haven't heard a word yet other than, oh, I must get around to that as a passing comment, but I still haven't heard. So I'm hoping that means things are good. I've got this question, I can't move forward, they won't get back to me. But the anger came when I was completely ignored. I wasn't even dismissed, I just wasn't even responded to at all in any way. And this was after he paid. Interestingly, in 2009, Berwyn Clayton's study showed 60% of respondents complained of the turnaround time for feedback. In a decade, it seems our RPL practice hasn't improved much. I suggest that practitioners who have dedicated role to RPL are less likely to neglect their RPL candidates. RPL is a people process. Candidates that sense they're being disregarded can lead to reduced motivation and disengagement from the process. There are three critical points for human contact. Now this can be virtually or face-to-face. -face. Before enrolment. Candidates want a human to talk to at the start to gauge the likelihood of success before they pay. Number two, on feedback after the first unit. This gives them firm goals to strive for um, in the other units and gives them context to ask questions. Number three, when, if as an assessor, you, have, you ask for further evidence. This is a high risk time um, for dropout. So good practice will also include regular touch points throughout the process to maintain motivation, provide clarification on collecting evidence and discuss documentary evidence, uh, gaps in documentary evidence, which there always is. Lack of RPL expertise. This problem is about assessors not being confident with the process and making it quite onerous for the student. And assessor said to me, Maybe as an assessor, I don't feel confident enough to know, to say, you know what, we're not going to use the RPL kit, we're going to do something different. But then I have to come up with a different process. I have to have a different tool. And then there's the issue of time and workload. And then the auditors want to have a look. I spent some time in Thailand speaking with the net regulator for the national training system. We discussed the difficulties uh, from a candidate's perspective and her, find, her findings and insights mirrored mine. There is a direct correlation between how onerous an assessment is for candidates and the experience and skills of the RPL assessor. RPL assessing assesses learning that is acquired in informal learning environments. We are trying to matrix an informal dynamic to a formal system. It requires skill. RPL assessors need to be able to step away from the templates and assess flexibly, whilst maintaining the principles of assessment and the rules of evidence. This requires experience, high level skills with mapping, expansive industry knowledge, and proficient interpersonal skills. Lack of management support also plays into this dynamic, particularly where vet practitioners had the skills and experience to conduct RPL, but are not given any agency to move away from the tools, which sometimes the tools themselves contravene the very flexible nature that RPL needs. So it's my suggestion, uh, staff that are dedicated solely to RPL, build and improve their expertise. We will hear a little bit later case stories that illustrate skills for RPL move beyond skills needed for mainstream assessment. Lack of rapport building. RPL is a difficult process. There are ups and downs. It's personal. We've seen most challenges for candidates are around mindset. Relationships are critical. Experienced assessors note here what they believe candidates struggle with. Does the assessor really have any skin in the game? Do they really care about my goals? Can I trust this person with my money to make a fair judgment of me? Am I going to be happy with their judgment? 
One assessor shared that those candidates who are upheeling high level quals find it particularly challenging to navigate the power balances and therefore accept the outcome. With mounting difficulties, finding the right evidence, getting employers verification, finding time, this assessor expressed that it's not uncommon for a collegial partnership to change to adversarial. Experienced RPL assessors understand the need for relationship building and they understand the intimate nature of RPL. A staff member exclusively dedicated to conduct RPL can provide the RTO with a consistent and reliable touch point for candidates. Many research subjects made explicit positive comments about certain things their assessors did that provided encouragement and helped them persevere. All candidates attributed diminishing difficulties to a good relationship with their assessor. He's very level-headed and accommodating, you know. He's a really good guy. He wrote me a card with his statement of attainment. So far, so good. That's a good touch. Keeps me motivated. They want people to succeed. I don't feel like a number. I feel like he's genuine and that's good. He really does care and that makes a big difference. So we see here RTO's reluctance to do RPL transpires as yet another barrier to RPL. Just do the course, it's easier. RPL just makes my job harder. I don't have time to do RPL. Admin think RPL is cheating. Other teachers think if they didn't teach it, candidates can't possibly know it. RTOs just don't want to do RPL. Centralised RPL became very bureaucratic. This dynamic was found in a study conducted by Bowen Clayton in 2009. She found 71% of students interviewed did not believe their RTO was genuinely committed to RPL. Typical comments back then were, they're only interested in making money, not helping students. If they're genuinely supporting RPL, they would promote it much more enthusiastically and make it a whole lot more user-friendly. And candidates pick this up. I feel, almost feel like they're not keen to RPL everything and I feel they're going to try and find something just to show that they've really looked into it. They presented it, frankly, as so much work. Why would you bother? I have many more comments from candidates that think it would probably be easier just to do the course. An interesting thing I've started researching is what really drives candidates to want to RPL? Why not just do the assessments if it's easier? There are some reasons I've heard around avoidance behaviour, like avoiding the classroom, which is particularly true for second chance learners um, who have had a negative learning experience. They have actively avoided the classroom. Usually their um, negative learning experiences come from school, but not ex exclusively. This is a dynamic I'm seeing in many countries. Also, candidates don't want to waste their time studying something that they know and can do. And frequently, their trainer knows less than what they do. However, ultimately, it appears people want to be recognised for their competence, for their years in the workforce. It's innate in us. It's not about seeking validation, self-esteem or kudos. It's around perceived self-efficacy. People who apply for RPL believe they are competent and want to be recognised for that. As one assessor said, RPL is personal, Deb. It's a big thing for people to put themselves on the line and say, hey, this is who I am, this is what I think I can do and what I know. Am I worthy? An experienced RPL assessor that works in an RTO that allows for RPL focus reduces this dynamic. Our guest speaker, Nicole, shares her case story that supports an economically feasible RTO structure that provides for this very focus.
systems that do not work. Do not allocate RPL expertise. They do not support candidates from start to finish. They trigger human contact only on problems. They assume RPL is an unsupported activity. It's assessment. Why do they need help? They either know it or don't. They assume candidates are always available. Typical candidates are mid-career. They have families, they're usually working full time. They're really busy. Some tips from the horse's mouth. Candidates love guidance and support. They like ready access for guidance and this does not have to be in real time. They like clear, succinct processes and resources. They like and need prompt feedback. Chat pods are great. YouTube videos give ideas of what edit evidence looks like and how they might be able to collate their evidence. They like flexible processes. An example was an individualized learning plan, which was really just a schedule of when things were due, but it was agreed upon from the assessor to the candidate. They like flexible assessment. They just want to demonstrate their competence. One said, I wish I could just sit down with the RTO and tell them about my job. They like that it's an iterative process, back and forth, not just one upload, yep, you've got it or not. So this is just one solution. Invest in RPL expertise. Grow your assessors to have proficiency, agency, and time to move away from the template. Trust your assessors. Part-time assessors are a good investment as they're still working in industry. Support candidates from start to finish. It, finish. Structure it so that Students' first contact with the RTO is with someone that knows RPL and believes in it. Proactively provide human contact rather than waiting for the problems. Assume RPL is a supported activity. Respect candidates' time. I suggest talk with your assessors to see support they need to streamline their process. They know where, um, how to make their job more efficient. Two small practical solutions, maybe um, design your templates so that they're editable. Build a repository of possible evidence. So that's a great segue into our interview with Wendy Cato. Hi, Wen. So you've indicated RPL expertise as critical to doing RPL better. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, Wen? Well, um, the thing is, from my experience in Australia, has been when the assessor knows what they're doing, it's a good process. Mm. Unfortunately, in most cases, assessors don't know what they're doing and therefore the experience for the assessor and the candidate is... Uh, less than satisfactory. In fact, it's frustrating and people get angry and just annoyed with the whole process and give up. Mm, and that's the bad reputation of RPL that we have. So in your view, um, yeah. in particular, about these problems, can you tell, tell us a bit more about that? Well, I'll give you two examples. Um, you know, without somebody with the skills in the RPL process, as I said, it can be a protracted and agonising experience for both people that are involved, both the assessor and the candidate. And one of the examples that I'll give you is I had an applicant come to me where she'd been working in a government role for about, eight, oh, well, for some years. And then um, they'd said to her that she would had been acting in a senior position and they were going to advertise that she needed to have a diploma. Uh, so we went through what she needed. I helped her put a portfolio together. We mapped all of her evidence and I took it along to the only RTO uh, that could actually assess it in the state. And when I did that, and um, 
I rang them up and asked them and they were a bit, mm. and so I decided I'd take portfolio in personally and meet the person in charge. And I got a lot of complaints for her about how RPI wasn't really her job, that she, you know, she had to do it on top of her workload and, you know, so really she didn't want to do it. Mm. Then she also explained to me that it would take a while because they didn't have anybody that could assess the whole qualification, so it would have to go through a number of assessors. So I, I left it with them. It took them six months to get back to my client. In that time, they hadn't contacted her at all. Uh, when they really? did get back to her, yeah, no, nothing, absolutely nothing. And when she contacted them, she got nothing back. And they sent her a letter, no phone call, nothing, just sent her a letter and said, oh, um, in some cases, you need additional evidence. They didn't explain what additional evidence she needed. They haven't discussed anything with her and that you would have to do some of these through training. Um, so overall... It was pretty poor because they could have actually rung her. They could have had discussions with her. She might have been up to clear up some of the gaps in her evidence uh, through discussions, but it just never happened. So really it was a totally unsatisfactory experience for her overall. Um, Did she pay, Wendy? Yeah, she had paid. She had paid. They made her enrol in all of the units before they would actually do the RPL. Wow. So she paid a lot of money. That's beyond okay. bad practice, is it? But anyways, yeah. and you've got another yeah, example it's there. It's mm. common. I hear it a lot. So in the other case, which is on the other side, um, when I was working as a dedicated RPL uh, mentor and assessor, I had a woman sent to me through the COAG program where I was mentoring. So that was from the government. And um, she came to me and I said to her, how can I help you? <laughs> she said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing here? She said, I don't know. I was just told to come. So I thought, well, she's obviously here for a reason because somebody sent her here. So we started having a discussion and she said to me, I said, what are you doing? She said, oh, just a housewife. And I'm like, okay, tell me a bit more. Oh, I've got five kids, you know, I had been out of the workforce for 12 years, haven't really done much. And so I'm like, okay. So I talked to her about what she'd done, you know, had she had any, any involvement with the school and we went around, you know, working in the canteen and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, we got around to this conversation where she said to me, oh, I was on the school council. And I said, well, that's great. And what were you doing? She said, oh, I sat on the school council and then I was asked to sit on the area council. I said, oh, interesting. Then I was asked to speak on the regional council. Then she was asked to sit on the state council. And currently when I'd met her, she was sitting on the federal independent council for school wow so, didn't think to mention that this lady no no well she's just a housewife that's what mm. she does that's what she told me i'm just a housewife nothing special you know, i don't know what i'm doing here. and by the time i finished talking to her it was quite evident that she was eligible for a diploma of community development or about and she was just amazed because according to her she was just a housewife so unless you have these conversations with people, you're going to have people who come in and go, I'm just a housewife or I don't know anything. I mm. don't do this. Mm. And actually they do. But when unless you, you are... Go on. Yeah, we talked earlier about um, self-assessments, how they can be not very helpful because of those cognitive yep. biases. Sometimes we think we're really good at stuff and we are not. And sometimes <laughs> we don't know what we know um so can you tell me the difference then in um this the difference between rpl assessing and mainstream coursework assessment and why that difference is critical well the difference is is that to be an rpl assessor you've actually got to have a higher level of skills you know when you do coursework your assessments are given to you and everybody is expected to churn out the same sort of evidence RPL, people are different. People have had different experiences. Some of those people need those experiences drawn out because they're not that comfortable or confident in what those experiences are or how they relate to what you're trying to do for them. You have to have um, a, a, a higher level of mapping skills because you're going to be mapping different evidence unlike 
you do in a classroom because people are going to give you different things and you have to have um, an experience in understanding what evidence is because if you think of evidence is just what comes on a piece of paper which is what you get in the classroom mm. then you're not going to do very well with RPO because mm. RPO evidence can be a number of things it can be me going to the workplace and shadowing somebody and watching them do what they work and doing observations it can be me setting them a challenge test so if somebody says I can do this I go well right just show me mm -hmm. just do it mm -hmm. um, it can be me collecting other evidence from the workplace such as work reports or training that they've done all of which they have never actually considered as being evidenced in the mm. past mm. so an rpl assessor skills are much higher level which is why it actually sits in the diploma which nobody does the unit there's actually a much higher level than your normal certificate for because it it involves having advanced mapping skills and advanced knowledge of what evidence can be not what you think it should be because mm. people are going to be staff and you go that's evidence well the context is a lot broader it's not just yeah. the um the assess the coursework that you're looking at um, but you've also got those human skills to be able to tease out um that skills language that they're not normally um using mm. Some people, you know, like, uh, I'll just give you a quick example because I know we're going to run out of time. Mm. But I had a guy who worked in the trades and he was not very uh, language skilled. And when I asked him what he did, he said, I do everything. And we went around in that circle for about 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> there was a few things in that from him when he's you know, like, I do absolutely everything. <laughs> okay, I, I, look, I have no doubts, but you know, can we be a bit more specific? In the end, um, I was interviewing two co-workers of his the next day and I understood that this gentleman did not have the language explain to me exactly what he's doing on the job. So I said to him, do you do what Fred and Danny do? And he goes, oh, yeah, we all work together and we swap around, we do it every day. And I said, great. So I ended the interview there and the next day I talked to Fred and Danny who were a lot more uh, better language skills and were able to tell me what they were doing. And I said, does Peter do this as well? And they go, yeah. So that's how I got my evidence. Wow. That was innovative. I was struggling. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew, I'm, this guy had been in the job Mm. for 20 years mm. you know and and it was in the construction industry and i know the construction industry and you don't stay in it that long if you're a poor worker mm. so he obviously had the skills he just couldn't explain them to me yeah all right as a wrap up when some of the big ticket items what do we need to do ticket items don't use self-assessments you're wasting your time because mm. people aren't going to do it you, you simply must must have um, a chat to the student right from the very start, and I'm in a good chat, not you know a knock them out chat. Um, have a good easy RPL guide. Don't bother giving them all of the the units of set, you know the units of competency and all the vet jargon. Tell them exactly what you want them to go and collect. Mm -hmm. uh, have good compliant RPL assessments that are mapped beforehand. Don't try mapping evidence at the end. Because if you're doing that, then what you're going to get is a whole lot of irrelevant evidence because if you haven't matched it to start with, then you don't know what evidence you want. Yeah, exactly. So you can tell the person what you want. And have a senior assessor who knows how to map and knows assessment and knows the rules of evidence and knows what evidence looks like mm -hmm. in many shapes. Otherwise, yeah. don't do it. Yeah. You're in the wrong job. Yeah. <laughs> It takes expertise to make something simple, no matter what trade, a trade or skill it is, hey? Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. But RPL is simple. If you have the process right, it's very, very simple. If you have it wrong, there's just tears mm. all the way around. Mm. And we'll leave that on that point. Thank you, Wendy. RPL is You're simple. Welcome. And that was when. Wendy will be given the mic at the end of the session, um, so just cue your questions for now. Um, next we hear from Nicole. So Nicole attributes 
her institution's 98% success rate to relationships. Her unit overachieves on income hours and is now mentoring other departments on improving their RPL approach. Nicole's been doing RPL for many years in both models, having to tack it on um, her job as a trainer and assessor and also as a sole focus. Um, please see the handouts um, about Nicole and Lorraine's program and her contact details should you have some more or want to contact her after the session as well. We're now going to hear from Nicole. Carl, you mentioned two of these problems are particularly critical in your experience. What two are those? So we thought the lack of rapport was, was critical and assessors not being invested. Mm. And what happens if you don't spend time to build rapport with students? So what, what we found a long time ago, so Lorraine and I ha, uh, share this job role and in the last 10 years we have been wholly and solely dedicated to RPL and relationships. What we found prior to that was that without that relationship building, without that tracking, that monitoring, um, that supporting and that mentoring that students often fell away and it did not complete the RPL and there was no success rate there at all. So what we've put into place now and over the last many years is a program that is very supportive um, and has lots of different avenues and ways students can be um, contacting Lorraine and myself and us as well being present in industry and present through their RPL process from beginning to the end. So you mentioned a particularly interesting story um, about a recent, or not a recent enrollment, but a little bit unusual. Can you tell me about that story yes. and how rapport building and also your um, reputation in industry um, led to this enrolment? So we, um, Lorraine and I are in industry on a weekly basis. We, we spend a lot of at all of these services. So we work in the long daycare sector outside school hours care and family day care. And our relationship um, is reciprocal. So we are very invested in our industry as they are invested in us and we support, that support goes both ways. So we had a centre and they've got a, a fairly new centre that they've moved to and they recently asked for two of their staff to be put onto RPL. And Lorraine and I went out and met the staff and spoke about the RPL process and what is involved in that process. We had a tour of the service and we um, talked about their skills on the floor and how long they've been working for and their, their background history. And whilst we were doing that, there was a mature age student there who's in her early 70s, who had a very old, old certificate three qualification and wanted to get a new upgraded qualification and has been working in industry for a very long period of time and was absolutely beautiful on the floor, but felt she didn't have the confidence or the skills to complete RPL like her colleagues were. So Lorraine and I- What kind of yeah. skills did she think that she didn't have? I mean, she's been working in the industry for a long time. What was her big, oh, yeah. I think um, she has the skills required. I think it's a confidence issue there, Deb. Mm. I think um, I think she was looking at her age. She was looking at um, possible retirement, and I think she felt the skills that she didn't have were probably technology, and that was going to be a barrier to her completing RPL. Oh, okay. So the skill to do RPL rather than the skills that she has in the Most job. Most definitely. Mm. Most definitely. Yeah. So Lorraine and I spoke to her at length about different ways that we could be supporting her. And that meant um, she didn't need to use a computer. We could find another way of her having to complete her RPL and collect her evidence. We actually printed her off the tool um, that she would be providing evidence for. We explained about different documents that she could be collecting. So we adapted the process slightly to suit her needs. And um, we also made sure that that tracking and that monitoring was happening. So in the very early days and her early, early collection of evidence, Lorraine would say to her, send it through to me, I'll have a look and we'll give you some feedback and see if you're on the right track. And she did that. 
And Lorraine had given her feedback and said, what you've collected maps across that unit beautifully and um, continue on with, you know, with the what you're doing. Mm. And look, that built up her confidence and she was thrilled and she's moved forward throughout her RPL um, and her confidence has grown. But not only that, we've also seen her um, confidence on the floor grow as well and in her job role. So what we've seen is that she's picking up new roles within the service that she otherwise wouldn't have picked up previously. She's feeling like she's on par with her colleagues now because she is completing a um, qualification that most majority of her colleagues have. And she's wanting to stay in the industry longer too, which is even fabulous because, you know, someone of her age with, um, with the background she's had, she's got wonderful nurturing skills that are such an asset to industry. We don't want to lose someone like that. Mm. So is there, has the employer noticed a difference? The employer has noticed a difference um, mm. and more so in her willingness to participate in, um, you know, group meetings, put information forward, changing of mm. policies and procedures. Wow. Um, just, much more, just much more motivated all round. Mm. Mm. So you also mentioned, um, that's a fabulous story. Um, you also mentioned some recent changes you've done in your enrolment process. Um, can you explain that for us? Yes, yeah, so um, in our RPL process, we are with our student from beginning to the end and that support does not waver. So upon enrolment, um, they will come to us, they will give them the enrolment documents, we'll go through an orientation which talks about um, RPL, gives you a very clear overview of expectations, what we require mm. from you, that this is a commitment and we make that very clear from the beginning too, because that's how we want them to be engaged in this process as well. Um, we talk about end dates and we um, have that that face-to-face -face contact about how this is going to look and how this is going to work and how we can support you. Yeah. So from that process, they then take their um, enrolment application or their or email their enrolment application over to student um, services, and then they are enrolled. What we had found, the difficulty we had, is that there had been a high staff turnover in student services. Yeah. And um, that enrolment process wasn't always going as smoothly as that beginning process with Lorraine and myself back at, um, you know, with RPL. So we have since made some changes and, um, and our director has been very supportive of that. And we have one person in place now who manages our RPL enrolment systems. And she um, has, has spreadsheets and tracks those students, but I suppose more importantly, understands RPL, mm. understands how they enrol and that many of our services are potentially paying for our students too, so they have to be invoiced for that. Um, so some of the enrolment procedures are slightly different to online students or full-time students. Um, and we've now got someone at client services and student services who understands in the enrolment procedure for RPL. And it, I suppose on top of that, Lorraine and I are also liaising very well with her too. So, so we are down in her office, we have meetings, we chat, she'll email us once every week and give us an update about enrolments and where we're at. So the relationship building doesn't just happen with our clients and industry, it also has to happen internally with our own systems as well. Yeah, that's a really good tip. Um, enrolments, with people that do not understand RPL builds, for my research, builds um, inaccurate expectations right from the start. Yes, yes. Mm. So you've, um, you've mentioned also, so relationships is key, um, having that um, support and service from end to end. Um, can you, you mentioned something about your RTO structure. How is that helpful for um, RPL? So for us, we have um, a manager and a director that are fully supportive of RPL. Mm. So we have a lot of autonomy in our role, but above and beyond all of that, we have a role that is wholly and solely dedicated to RPL. So Lorraine and I aren't in many other roles across our, our division. We are just dedicated to RPL only, and all our time and energy is spent on RPL. And 
we, we have full support from our director and manager for that. So we have autonomy in our role. We, um, we are able to make changes and be creative and adapt to industry's needs in our role without having to go through several different processes. Um, it, it makes a huge difference to have people above, up above, be supportive of RPL and can see the value in RPL as well. So one of the big problems that I found in the research was that um, so a lot of um, assessors felt really frustrated. They knew that their candidates needed the support, but the allocation of, you know, you've got three hours to do this RPL, um, that was probably the biggest barrier for assessors. So that you don't have that problem? We don't have that problem, no. No, I'm, I'm thrilled to say we don't have that problem. Um, look, it, it may have been a problem many years ago. Um, uh, you know, I'm talking probably over 10 years ago when we first started out. But no, we have, um, we have managers and directors that can see the value in RPL and are encouraging sections to do RPL and so much so that I now um, are actually helping to mentor and support a building construction uh, course at oh, wow. East Perth, which is not um, not too far from me at Joondalup. But um, we, I now help support them and are helping them with their RPL and making changes to make that a far more successful operation as well. Wow, that'd be fun. It is. It's great. I love it. <laughs> be like starting from scratch again, though, wouldn't it? It is, it is, but sharing the knowledge and um, I suppose what we've learnt over many years and the successes with another section and be able to see them start to implement that is really satisfying. Great. Well, I think we'll just wrap up there, um, Nicole, and we'll welcome any questions. Um, and I also appreciate your time coming today. Um, and hopefully you'll be a regular guest on our webinars. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, Nicole. So that's a, um, a wrap up for our webinar. Um, I do invite other guests for our other webinars. Um, once you have a look at the topics and you feel that um, you know of or you are practicing at, um, at, a, at a good level that you would like to share. I'm looking at the questions. Do you, um, I'm going to hand the uh, mic to um, Nicole um, and Wendy if you would like to ask any questions. Maybe put them in the chat box. or even comments, insights. Is there something that we maybe missed? Mm. Yeah, good question, Michelle. Yeah. Um, Perhaps we could give, uh, is that something that you can do, Michelle? You could give the mic to Nicole for that um, because they do have good support from their management and directors. But she does say that is uh, attributed to people, not necessarily a structure. Philip asks, how do you differentiate between RPP? How do you differentiate between RPL and credit transfer and advanced standing? Um, I'm not sure if that's a rhetorical question, but for me, 
um, my study was um, RPL in the vet sector of informal learning. Um, that was the focus of my study. Mm. Now I was hoping to give the mic to um, Nicole. Activated for Nicole and Wendy to um to have presenter mode um i'm not sure if if the tech is is doing us any favors at the moment but definitely the chat window is working so um, i can see wendy's put in there that rpl is not credit transfer which is where the people already hold the unit and that's exactly right but i what i took from um some of the information that that deb and wendy and nicole through their videos were able to share with us today is that um, there seems to be a lack of understanding with the the people working in an RTO as to the different nuances between the different processes, let alone uh, understanding RPL in itself. So um, I would imagine that that's one of the, the difficulties that, that people face when they don't have an organisation or an operation, which is what Deb's first tip to doing RPL better would be to have someone solely dedicated to RPL with that understanding. If they don't have that um, capacity on board, it's a, a very difficult thing, I, I suggest. And Philip's saying, agreed, how, how does one differentiate between them? Well, I guess I would refer back to um, some of the information that guides many RTOs in their processes their, um, and also the EVETMIS requirements for how they they need to enter that information for the um, issuance of certification. I would suggest that a lot of people are just relying on that sort of information as a guidance. Wendy's saying um, due to the lack of training in RPL, even though people do do it in their cert for it is um, minimal. Uh, I've changed that. To minimal there is that right Wendy um, I, I agree it's it's like a lot of things that come out of um, the, the cert four that's a, a beginner's ticket if you like um, and it was mentioned many times throughout the session today Debbie was saying that there's a definite mm -hmm. skill set involved with RPL like this is not a beginner level um, situation so um, it's a skill set that one would develop further after getting that entry level ticket which is the cert four that's your entry level ticket to train and access train and assess others um and absolutely when disagreeing with us there rpl is for experienced assessors only and um, just reading out the chat there nicole saying if clients need to apply for a credit transfer uh, in their organization they support the clients or the candidates with the documentation and point them in the right direction but uh, at their RTO, it's a very separate process to RPL, which is good. Mm. So it was asked a question before about how um, to get management on board. The biggest um, barrier from a manager's and, and business model, I guess, is how it, it, it comes across as being very labour intensive and um, you need that personal touch and then how can you then um, make this to be profitable mm. um, and here Nicole's responding to that yeah involve your management in your RPL process get them to understand the value of RPL what it brings to the college which can be more about enrollments in other delivery models which can also be more enrollments in other delivery models also Nicole I think you get industry on board as well industry see the benefit of um, credentialing their staff, not only because of the um, award, but because it it promotes um, reflective practice. So it gets your workers to think and check 
um, on their own practices. And there is evidence to say that workplace uh, productivity um, and performance increases after RPL. And Deb, Philip's just adding to the conversation here and saying that in his opinion, RPL is conducted as a part of all assessments because there's direct and indirect evidence. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that goes into um, drilling down into the theory of learning when you consider that in able to answer or provide evidence for one aspect, there's also um, a, like an iceberg or almost a degree of underlying um, tacit evidence, uh, tacit knowledge that, that needs to be applied to supply the evidence that's explicitly needed um, to, for the particular question or task at hand. So it, it is an interesting viewpoint and I hope I've interpreted that comment correctly, Philip, if you could just give me a thumbs up or a, a yes in the chat box there. Um, and, and, and that is an interesting consideration. Too often, I, I think assessors can fall into the trap that there is um, a limited time allocated for marking assessments, let alone RPL assessments. And that's what you were mentioning before, Deb. So um, it, you get what you get given and you've got to mark against that particular marking guide or the rubric and, and um, sometimes there's little scope to go outside of that and to investigate uh, any of that indirect evidence, which is what I think Philip's making reference to. Such an interesting conversation from the point of view, we're, we're drilling down into all sorts of uh, theories and possibilities because we've got business operations as a consideration, we've got individual psyche as a consideration, learning theory, um, and, and we haven't really delved into the compliance aspect of it because we're just talking about RPL as a process, but all of those things are intertwined and I can just imagine uh, all of the rabbit holes that your research would take you down, Deb. Oh, look, I'm really enjoying it. Um, there Another thing that has been started to talk about with RPL across the globe, actually, is there is an actual learning aspect um, to RPL. Mm. When you start looking at your claim, do I actually know this? And, yeah, I've been doing it for 20 years, but does that mean that I've been doing it at industry standard and to the expectations that are standardised across the sector? Um, so my candidates found that they... Um, they found it as a, a professional um, development exercise where it was um, they were reflecting on their practice um, and there was some adjustments they did to their practice because they went through the RPL process. Some of them said, well, you know, um, I do this actually much better in, in my workplace. Um, this is a baseline, this, um, this standard. So there is an aspect to um, meta-learning around RPL. It's about thinking do I actually know what I think I know? And how is that reflected in my practice? Absolutely. Well, we're just coming up to time. So if there's uh, no, oh, sorry, Renee's just popped in something. So I'll leave you to address that, Deb. Um, the diploma we do the RPL for in our industry is extremely hands-on, skills-based that we do RPLs for. And I find it very time consuming and difficult at the start to assess students' capabilities, especially since a lot of it is practically based. This is somewhat somewhere I really tr find trying to be fair and reasonable. I'm definitely wanting to refine this process and make the RPL better and smoother for both the RTO and the applicants. So this is where my interest in this webinar series stems from. Mm. And, mm. And, and on that, thank you for sharing that, Renee, uh, hoping if you've get, gathered or gained at least one idea out of um, Deb's introduction to her research today, pop in the chat what you think might be something to consider as you go back into your um, RTO practice. But um, it is part of a 10-part series, and I'm just going to drop into the chat for you now. Um, Deb's next session is going to be um, teaching RPL to empower the learner. So that's in a, a couple of weeks' time. The third session, we're going to look at facilitating social learning. And as we've said, it is a bundle of 10. So Deb's got 10 sessions exploring 10 different facets of different things that RTOs could do to make RPL a better and more efficient process. So if you are interested in coming along to all 10, there's special pricing applied there through the bundle package. 
So those links are live through the chat. They'll take you directly to the enrolment um, through the VETA portal if you're interested in joining us again for those. And I'm also um, going to drop in for you Deb's LinkedIn. Uh, so if you're interested in carrying over this conversation further and, con you know, making connections with Deb about uh, RPL processes, find her on LinkedIn and direct via her email. We've got that there for deb at debcar.com.au. So uh, another question's popped in for you, Deb. I'm okay mm. if, you, if you're still okay to, to keep going. We can go for another couple of moments. Sure, I didn't know if it shut down um, automatically. Um, yeah, the rules of evidence um, provide constraints and make it so complex. Look, um, I've, I've written an article on overly prescriptive units on, um, and you can access that through my LinkedIn. And as I said before, there are systemic issues in our system, as good as it is, it is state of the art. I haven't found a national system that is competency-based that has RPL, um, the policy and regulatory framework that we've got is, is outstanding. We have to conduct RPL to such a level and our units are so prescriptive that that in itself is a huge barrier. I'm doing a um, program um, at the moment with the, with the UAE and um, we're looking at doing an RPL program. Um, they're not going down to um, assessment conditions, skills and knowledge. The elements and the PCs, the elements are really your key for what I can see, the key to um, your workplace activities. Um, not sure if I've answered your question or helped you at, at all, Cynthia, but it it is difficult, complex. I that's why um, Wendy and I agree here is that you must be an expert with mapping. You must be able to tease out a workplace task that you can observe all those skills, or as many skills as you can in there and have a conversation about that or anecdote um, the evidence. And Philip's just popping in there as well that most countries do have some sort of RPL. And, and it is interesting to, to note that of all of the, the countries that you've studied and had experience with, even though um, some of the 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 climate within our own system at the moment is that if people are feeling it, it's not a, a system conducive to delivering what's required, it is still considered one of the better. So that, that's encouraging as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm hoping to visit um, Canada and um, South Africa and Germany next, uh, next year to have a look at um, candidates experience in, in each one of those systems. Mm. and Exciting. we would love to hear some of the observations that come out of that but uh, mm. we're just coming up to 10 minutes over time so we'll wrap it up there I've put your um, details in the chat box so please if you've got any other questions or comments or you'd like to continue the conversation with Deb there's a number of ways that you can get in contact with her remember that the recording for today's session is going to be made available um, shortly thereafter and to access your PD record from today's session just uh, make sure that you follow the links that come from the feedback email generated by the VETA team. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, Phil's just saying look up Susan Simosco uh, if you go to Canada so there's a contact for you if anyone's headed over to Canada. Thanks everyone for joining us. Deb it's been an absolute pleasure to host uh, your first uh, session on 10 tips for doing RP RPL better in, R in RTOs. That's a tongue twister. Say that three times mm. fast. <laughs> I want to say thank you to our guest um, speakers as well, um, Wendy and, um, and Nicole. Um, it would have been lovely. Thanks, Wen. It would have been lovely for you ha to have the mic so you could answer some of these um, questions yourselves because it is important that rather than just have our opinions, we talk from practice. Mm. 
and having uh, the snapshot of the videos was a very uh, good touch to inject more than just one talking head on the screen and sharing those that consensus throughout industry. So definitely agree that that was very well done. And thank you, of course, to Wendy and Nicole. Thank you to Deb and thank you to everyone for joining us today. If you're interested in being a guest, come and see me. Yep, you've got your details. Okay, folks, thanks again. Bye now. Bye.